attorney for the Southern District of New York. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, New York Republican Congressman Chris Collins, who turned himself into the FBI earlier today. I, I'm not quite sure. Has this press conference already started? Okay, so it hasn't started yet. As soon as it begins, though, we're going to bring it to you live. Hi, everyone. I'm Anne Marie Green. Here's what's going on with Collins. He's been indicted on securities fraud charges, and he'll be arraigned later on today at 2 p.m. The New York lawmaker is accused of using inside information on a biotechnology company to make illicit stock trades. In light of the allegations, House Speaker Paul Ryan announced today that Collins will no longer serve on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Earlier, I spoke to Ed O'Keefe about the charges. Well, federal prosecutors expected to announce more details later today, and the congressman himself is expected to address these charges a little later. What they're alleging, though, is that this is tied to his connections, his investment in an Australian pharmaceutical company. This has been percolating uh, for the last year and a half or so. Uh, among other things, in a 30-page indictment, it points out that some of the questionable activity may have actually occurred during the 2017 White House congressional picnic. There were phone calls between the congressman to his son, who is also indicted today and another person indicted the father of the congressman's son's fiance. Uh, in a statement the congressman's attorney say we will answer the charges filed against congressman Collins in court and will mount a vigorous defense to clear his name. They say that they're confident he will be vindicated and exonerated and plans to say more about this later today. Who's Chris Collins? Important to point this out. He is one of the president's biggest defenders on Capitol Hill, was one of his earliest supporters, and is somebody who has known Donald Trump through New York state political circles for quite some time. All right, so this is a live shot of New York. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that that information that the congressman is accused of passing along had to do with a failed drug test that this uh, company um, did. So when this um, press conference begins, we're going to bring it to you live. You can see they've got a whole outline of what happened when, and uh, we'll bring that to you shortly. So also, during an earlier conversation with Ed O'Keefe, Ed addressed last night's special election in Ohio. Republican Troy Balderson claimed victory in the state's 12th congressional district, but he leads by just 1,700 votes. Why is that important? He leads over Democrat Danny O'Connor, but 8,000 provisional and absentee ballots still have to be counted. Ed O'Keefe discussed what we learned from this election looking ahead to November and the midterms. It's significant, and the reason it drew the attention of the nation is the fact that this is a congressional district where in 20. 16, the then Republican incumbent won by 36 points. Republicans have held the seat since the early 1980s. President Trump won here by 11 points in 2016. Republicans shouldn't be ending up in a situation where they're winning a special election by less than one percentage point. But such are the political times we live in that the Democrats were able to eke it out and get this close. And they argue there are districts all across the country that are far more competitive than this one, where Republicans are the incumbent or where they've been controlling the seat for the last several years and they believe if we can do it here, this is a sign that it's going to happen all over the country come November. Mm -hmm. So you've been talking to voters there. What are they telling you about why they back the candidates they backed? Republicans will tell you they're with Ballison because he's with President Trump. They see support for the president and the GOP agenda as important. They want to see it continue. Democrats say part of the reason they showed up is because of President Trump, that they don't like what he's been up to. They don't like his temperament. They don't like his agenda. They want to see a Democrat elected from here and Democrats retake control of the House so that they can serve on it as a check on the White House. It was telling. We, we spoke with one woman uh, on Election Day who told us that she had been planning to participate. She was always going to vote. But seeing the president come here to this congressional district on Saturday for Troy Balderson made her so bound and determined to show up. She went, she set a Google Calendar notification and in big letters with an exclamation point wrote, vote for Election Day, saying, I want everything, I, I wanted to do everything I could to, to make sure that the president is robbed of this congressional seat. That is very interesting because, as you know, Ed, uh, the president tweeted earlier uh, con congratulating um, Balderson, but also very quickly taking credit for uh, shifting the race in his favor. So, you know, you, you talked about sort of the impact that 
the president's presence had on at least a, a Democratic voter. But I'm wondering about Republicans. Were they energized by him coming? And, and, and can we uh, sort of uh, extrapolate anything from that about uh, what sort of impact he might have on the races in November? So when we talked to Troy Baldison the other day about this, because there had been some questions about whether or not he wanted the president to come at all, he said, look, it, it motivated and energized Republican voters in this district to have the president and the vice president come in basically the last seven days of the race. And the president may have a point that he was, in essence, the closer for Balderson, that he was able to tell his coalition of supporters, you've been there for me, you got to be here for this guy. If ultimately Balderson ekes it out here, even if it is by less than 1%, it proves that, yes, in certain cases, the president continues to be a big help for down-ballot Republicans. And if Balderson pulls it off, even by the slimmest of margins, you're going to continue to see the president show up all across the country. He's headed to upstate New York next week to help two incumbent House Republicans in districts there. The Democrats think they can get at least one of them. Uh, Ted Cruz down in Texas is talking openly about having the president come help him in a closer-than-anticipated Senate re-election race there. And he vows to campaign as often as he can in the final two months of this election season. So if you thought this race was nice, don't fear, they will be doing it twice. Both of these candidates will be matched up again in November. Can we expect anything different? I like the rhyming, Anne-Marie. <laughs> uh, the difference will probably be that because it's being held on actual election day, traditional election day, the turnout model that people are accustomed to around here will probably take effect, and that is that you will see far more Republicans actually show up to vote. It's early August. People are still on vacation here. School hasn't started yet. Both sides were griping about the fact that this was being held in the middle of the summer. They may have a point. And so that's why Democrats know it will be harder for O'Connor to get ahead of Balderson come November if uh, or when there is a rematch in this race. They both secured the nomination for their parties. So the voters of the 12th, election, uh, 12th uh, Congressional District here in Ohio are going to keep hearing from them for the next 90 days or so. Well, book your hotel stay then at O'Keefe in Ohio. Thanks a lot. <laughs> We're here at least one more day. See you later. <laughs> All right, we're taking you back to New York, where a press conference uh, regarding New York Republican Chris Collins is underway. He's been charged with security fraud. Let's take a listen. At the expense of regular investors, and then he lied about it to law enforcement to cover it up. Also charged is his son, Cameron Collins, and Stephen Zarsky, the father of Cameron's fiance. These charges are a reminder that this is a nation of laws and that everybody stands equal before the bar of justice. Now I'd like to go into the details of the allegations a little more. In addition to serving in the House of Representatives, Congressman Collins was also on the board of directors of Innate Immunotherapeutics a publicly traded company that was developing a drug for multiple sclerosis. In June of 2017, Congressman Collins was told some confidential and highly sensitive information about innate, information that was not yet made public, namely that innate's main drug, the drug innate was developing to be the backbone of its company, was a total failure. This was devastating information for the company. Congressman Collins had an obligation, a legal duty, to keep that information secret until that information was released by the company to the public. But he didn't keep it secret. Instead, as alleged, he decided to commit a crime. He placed his family and friends above the public good. Congressman Collins was a major investor in Innate, and so was his son Cameron. The congressman knew he couldn't sell his own shares for personal and technical reasons, including that he was already under an investigation regarding Innate by the Congressional Ethics Office. The crime that he committed was to tip his son Cameron so that Cameron and a few select others could trade on the news while the investing public remained in the dark. 
As the indictment alleges, that's exactly what they did. His son Cameron sold. Cameron's fiance sold. The father of the fiance, Zarsky, sold. Mr. Zarsky's wife sold. Other friends and relatives sold. And be all because Congressman Collins violated his duty to keep innate information secret. And when the news of the drug's failure became public, the stock plummeted. In total, the conspirators used the inside information to avoid over $750,000 in losses. But Congressman Collins couldn't keep his crime a secret forever. The FBI asked to interview him, and instead of telling the truth, he lied. And so did Cameron Collins, and so did Steven Zarsky. By lying to the FBI, they compounded their insider trading crime with the crime of criminal cover-up. Now I'd like to go over to these two charts which summarize some of the allegations in the indictment. This first chart is a tipping chain. It demonstrates the flow of the illegal insider information and the trading, the illegal trading on that information. At the top of the chain is Congressman Collins. He had an obligation as a Nate board member when he received confidential corporate, corporate information to keep that information secret until the company announced it to the public. In total disregard of that obligation, minutes after Congressman Collins received the devastating, highly confidential news that a Nate's drug had failed its drug trial, Congressman Collins tipped that inside information to his son so that his son could trade. Cameron Collins, when he received that illegal inside information, he did two things, both of which are illegal. He sold stock based on that inside information and avoided $570,000 in losses. And he also took that illegal inside information and tipped others. He tipped his fiance. He tipped his fiance's wife. He tipped his fiance's father. And he tipped a friend, all of whom traded on that illegal inside information. Steven Zarsky, his fiance's father, avoided $143,000 in losses by trading on that information, and he tipped others. He tipped his brother, he tipped his sister, and he tipped a friend, two of whom traded on the information, one attempted to trade on the information, but was unable. In total, the conspirators avoided losses of over $768,000, all because of the initial illegal insider trading tip by Congressman Collins. In this chart, we set some of the key allegations in the indictment against a timeline, a backdrop of the innate share price. On the evening of June 22nd, 2017, Congressman Collins was at a congressional picnic. And at 6.55, he received an email from the CEO of innate informing him of the horrendous news that the drug had failed its trial. At 7.10 p.m., Congressman Collins responded to that email. So as the indictment alleges, at least at 7.10 p.m., Congressman Collins was aware of the inside information. A minute later, Congressman Collins attempts to call his son. In a period of five minutes, there are six unsuccessful calls. On the seventh call, at 7.16 p.m., as alleged in the indictment, Congressman Collins tips 
illegally tips his son Cameron about the drug trial results so that his son Cameron could trade on those results. Later that evening, on June 22nd, after Cameron Collins has the illegal insider trading information, Cameron Collins drives with his fiance to his fiance's parents' house. They arrive at the house at 9.17 p.m. Less than 20 minutes later, at 9.34 p.m., the fiance's mother is on the phone with her broker beginning the process of selling her shares of innate. The next morning on June 23rd at 7.42 a.m., Cameron Collins begins the process of selling his shares of innate. During June 23rd and June 26th, Cameron Collins sells approximately 1.39 million shares of innate prior to the market close of June 26. After the market closes, Innate announces to the public that its drug had failed the trial. And the next day, the drug price, the price of Innate, falls off a cliff. It drops 92% in value in a single day. This was the drop that was anticipated by the co-conspirators. This was the drop in value that the co-conspirators avoided by selling their shares before the public announcement. And they could only sell those shares by virtue of the initial tip of inside information by Congressman Collins. Case of this type and significance obviously involves the SEC and the FBI, and their representatives are standing up here with me today. To my left is my good friend Bill Sweeney, the assistant director in charge of the FBI's New York field office. And to the far left is John Brosnan, the special agent in charge of the FBI New York office criminal division. The FBI's work on this case was spectacular, and I want to thank them for their professionalism and dedication. We work with the FBI on so many important cases, and it is always a privilege. To the left of Bill is, is Stephanie Avakian and Steve Pekin, who are co-directors of the SEC's Division of Enforcement. I want to thank them and the SEC for their hard work on this matter. Last, I want to acknowledge and thank the career prosecutors in my office handling the case. To my right is Max Nicholas, Damian Williams, Bob Allen, Scott Hartman, and the co-chiefs of our Securities and Commodities Fraud Task Force, Tim Kasoulis and Jason Cowley. Congressman Collins, who by virtue of his office helps to write the laws of our nation, acted as if the law didn't apply to him. The charges today demonstrate once again that no matter what the crime and no matter who committed it, we stand committed in the pursuit of justice without fear or favor. I would now like to invite to the podium Bill Sweeney. Thank you, Jeff, and good afternoon, everybody. U.S. Representative Christopher Collins sat on an eight board of directors for a period of more than three years, spanning the run-up to the drug trial announcement in mid-2017. Collins himself was the company's largest shareholder. In or about the summer of 2017, a drug designed to treat a debilitating form of multiple sclerosis had entered the late stages of a phase 2B clinical trial. This drug, MIS-416, was the only viable drug in the pipeline for innate. 
This is significant in that the company's value was nearly completely wrapped up in the success of the clinical trial and a subsequent phase three trial. On the evening of June 22, 2017, Collins received an email informing him that MIS-416 had failed its clinical trial. Electronic records indicate his initial shock at having received the news. The drug once anticipated to hold billions of dollar in value would now be the cause of significant financial loss for Innate and of course its investors, many of whom shared a personal relationship with Congressman Collins. While, Cong while the Congressman was legally bound to keep his information confidential, until the trial results were released to the investing public four days later on June 26, we allege he did not. The indictment charges that Collins immediately began contacting the family and friends he had bought into the fold. This set off a ripple effect in which many investors directly or indirectly connected to Congressman Collins were notified. Most of them quickly sold their shares. An eight stock price plummeted 92% on the first trading day following the public announcement. But Collins conspirators had saved themselves over $750,000 in losses. Collins himself, having been prohibited from selling his shares for various reasons, did not avoid a financial loss. Despite this fact, his alleged actions brought him face to face with federal agents who had become aware of the crime that had been committed. When questioned by law enforcement about the alleged dealings, Congressman Collins, his son Cameron, Cameron's fiance's father, Stephen Zarsky, lied plain and simple. Today they are charged with insider trading and lying to federal law enforcement agents. While Collins may have thought that giving his family and friends a heads up about material, non-public information would benefit them in the long run, here's a better inside tip for those who think they can play by a different set of rules. Access to this kind of information carries with it significant responsibility, especially for those in society who hold a position of trust. Act honorably and in accordance with the law and do not lie to special agents of the FBI. Many thanks always to our partners, especially Jeff and your team of career prosecutors. Gentlemen, your work has been exceptional. To the SEC, I'd personally like to thank Stephanie and Steve for your work. Your team has also been outstanding. To John and John Cassell, who lead our white collar branch, and to your team of special agents and investigators, I want to uh, extend my personal appreciation. Some are standing in the back in the shadows, but to Nick, John, Yelena, and Tracy, your work has been exceptional. What you do in the community matters and makes a difference. Thank you. I'd like to invite to the podium Stephanie Avakian, co-director of enforcement at the SEC. Thanks, Jeff. Good afternoon. As Jeff said, my name is Stephanie Avakian and I'm co-director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement. And before I begin my remarks, I'd like to also thank U.S. Attorney Jeff Berman and his prosecutors, as well as the FBI, who worked on this matter for their assistance. Today, the SEC filed securities fraud charges against Congressman Christopher Collins, his son Cameron Collins, and three others alleging that they engaged in insider trading ahead of innate immunotherapeutics announcement of negative drug trial results in June 2017. The SEC's complaints allege that Christopher Collins learned of the negative news in his capacity as a member of innate's board of directors and quickly tipped Cameron Collins, who held a large position in innate stock. In addition to Cameron Collins selling nearly 1.4 million of his own innate shares, he is alleged to have tipped his girlfriend, defendant Lauren Zarsky, her mother, defendant Dorothy Zarsky, and her father, defendant Steven Zarsky. The SEC further alleges that Steven Zarsky, after trading in his own account, further tipped his sibling and a friend. The SEC's complaints seek disgorgement of the defendant's ill-gotten gains, interest, penalties, and permanent injunctions. The SEC also seeks an order barring Christopher Collins from serving as an officer or director of a public company. Being a director of a public company is a privilege, a privilege that comes with responsibilities. Christopher Collins is alleged to have abused this privilege and breached his responsibilities by engaging in illegal insider trading. 
Defendants Lauren Zarsky and Dorothy Zarsky, whom the SEC alleges each avoided losses by selling all of their innate shares in advance of the company's negative announcement, have each agreed to settle the charges against them by consenting to injunctions, disgorging their ill-gotten gains, and paying civil penalties. Lauren Zarsky, a certified public accountant, has also agreed to be suspended from practicing before the commission as an accountant for a period of at least five years. Accountants who engage in illegal insider trading should not serve in the role of gatekeeper in our securities markets. The settlements are subject to court approval. And now let me turn things over to Stephen Pekin, co-director of the Enforcement Division, for some additional remarks. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, first off, I'd like to commend the excellent work of the SEC staff members who handled this investigation and who will handle the litigation going forward. They're William Max Hathaway, Colby Steele, Patrick McCluskey, Carolyn Welshans, Melissa Armstrong, and Cheryl Crumpton. The SEC's Insider Trading Enforcement Program is a great success. We have successfully detected and pursued insider trading schemes of all shapes and sizes, from massive international schemes to trade on information stolen through cyber intrusions to those perpetrated by a single faithless insider. <clears throat> In the past five years alone, thanks to the staff's hard work, its ever-developing expertise, and its use of highly effective proprietary analytical tools, the SEC has filed more than 250 insider trading cases against more than 450 individuals. Today's case is another example of the staff's dedication and know-how. At the heart of this action, as described in our complaint, is a tipping chain that extends from Christopher Collins to his son Cameron Collins to members of the Zarsky family and beyond. When members of the SEC's Market Abuse Unit, a specialized group within the Division of Enforcement, uncovered suspicious trading by Cameron Collins, they did not stop there. As you heard, they identified well-timed trades by people close to him, including his girlfriend, her mother, her father, and her father's relative and friend. In addition to finding the trading at the core of this action, the staff who worked on this matter, working alongside the talented prosecutors here in the Southern District of New York and the dedicated men and women of the FBI, developed a thorough and compelling evidentiary record. That record, which is summarized in the SEC's complaints, consists of emails and text messages, cell phone records, trading data, communications, including recorded calls with brokerage firms, IP logon information, and other. It reflects frantic efforts by tippers to convey inside information and traders to sell their innate shares before the company's negative news announcement. As alleged in our complaints, the defendants and their tippies accounted for over half of innate's entire trading volume on the first trading day after they got the news and Cameron Collins himself accounted for more than half of all the innate shares sold on the next trading day. Insider trading is not just illegal, it is also corrosive. It threatens investor confidence in the fairness and integrity of our markets. For our capital markets to retain their place as the envy of the world, the SEC and its law enforcement colleagues must be vigilant in policing against this misconduct. Those who would engage in this sort of behavior should know that we will continue to devote our resources, our expertise, and our energy to finding them and seeking to hold them accountable. Thank you. We'll take your questions. Yes. Is there a wiretap involved here? And if not, how did you discover that the congressman had lied to you uh, about the conversation with his son? Uh, there's no allegation of a uh, wiretap in this case. And with respect to the details of the evidence that are not contained in the indictment, uh, DOJ policy restricts me to the four corners of the indictment, so I'm not going to get into proof of trial. Is it true that the congressman promoted this bill to or the company to other members of Congress? And there are there any other members of Congress that are under investigation? That is not an aspect of, uh, uh, of this indictment. I have no comment.
Well, the, 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 the indictment alleges that on the evening of June 22nd, 2017, when Congressman Collins uh, received the information via an email from the CEO of Innate that he was at the congressional picnic and that uh, it was from that picnic that he then uh, tried to reach his son uh, six attempts in five minutes and then on the seventh attempt he got through to his son and he uh, it is alleged in the indictment that he Ill illegally relayed the results of that drug test so that his son could trade on that information and that was all done as alleged in the indictment at the congressional picnic uh, Uh, I, I, the indictment does not specify the phone that he used, and I, I don't think I'm, a, I'm allowed under DOJ policy to go outside the four corners of the indictment. Sir, the indictment says that there are a number of co-conspirators. Are any of those co-conspirators I have no comment on that. Uh, I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to get into uh, how uh, this matter was referred to our office. Yes. The congressman's statement said he didn't make any trades. Uh, the complaint says that he uh, spoke with his, with his son with the anticipation that his son would then act on the tip. How do you go about proving that anticipation was knowing? What, do you need to prove knowing? What, what will interest you here, uh, burden to bear here, and what evidence do you have? Well, yeah, the indictment alleges that the congressman conveyed the illegal inside information anticipating that his son uh, was going to trade on that information and I, I can't get into the evidence of trial right now. I can't go beyond the four corners of the indictment. Um, we're about three months away from a congressional election. Is your office aware of any sort of uh, trade agreements that may be happening Well, politics does not enter into our decision-making on uh, charging a case. We bring a case when the case is ready to be brought. That being said, we are cognizant of the prudential concerns surrounding an election. But, you know, here we are months away from the election, and those concerns do not apply. All right, we've been listening to a press conference uh, here in New York, the U.S. Attorney's uh, Office. Uh, Congressman Chris Collins is facing insider trading uh, charges. Basically, the story, according to the U.S. Attorney's Office, is that uh, he w ha was a large shareholder in a uh, drug company. That drug company was focused on creating a drug to treat multiple sclerosis, MS. But their drug tests failed. According to the U.S. attorney, uh, Congressman Collins got that information, but because he was holding so many shares, he did not sell the shares himself, but he told his son, his son's fiance, his future, his son's future father-in-law, and they all sold their shares in order to avoid a downturn. Uh, the stocks for this company took a, a major plunge, and uh, they managed to avoid about $750,000 in losses. That, those are the allegations right there. And then they were questioned by the FBI. And according to the U.S. Attorney's Office, they lied about this. So that's what's going on right now with uh, Congressman uh, Collins. Just so you know, um, Congressman Collins' attorneys have issued a statement. They say that uh, they are confident that he will be completely vindicated and exonerated, and they will mount a vigorous defense to clear his good name. But these are major charges, a whole lot of uh, headaches for Representative Collins moving forward. He's going to be arraigned a little bit later on today. We're going to take a quick break. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on.